Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk briefly about hip prothesis, about hip buttock augmentation surgery. I'm surprised I haven't done a video until now. This is another surgery that we do frequently, a specialized surgery. It has a couple of pinpoints. I have a website for that. I have a website called aestheticpopo.com, which is dedicated just for this. I haven't made a video though. I'm not going to repeat the information that's available on the website here. I'm just going to mention a few unique features and not expand on the video. Now, the several methods to perform botox augmentation. Fat injection can be performed. There's also a filler injection. A prosthesis can be used for augmentation, botox prosthesis. In my opinion, is the healthiest all of them. This is because the botox prosthesis primarily shapes the buttocks. You can also remove it anytime. It also doesn't cause any complications. In other words, it doesn't cause cancer or anything, something like that. It is unclear what the injected permanent fillers will do in the future. Also, it doesn't shape the buttocks or provide as much augmentation as you would like. Because as far as I know, 100 or 200 cc is injected. They may not be enough. Also, if you had a filler and if you try to put in a prosthesis to make it even bigger on top of that, it causes a fungal infection this time. The problem extends the prosthesis removal. Therefore, there can be no prosthesis after the filler. In other words, silicone implants are not feasible. You should be aware of this fact. If you are going to do the fillers, you need to keep this in mind. This type of fillers breaks down very slowly. If you had buttocks augmentation with fillers, you will not have the chance to use implants for 10 years. You should be aware of this. That being said, they also do fat injections. That's a technique I've never used because it's extremely dangerous. Many patients around the world have died from fat injection embolism. This is known as Brazilian butt lift, BBL. I don't perform BBL because it's a risky procedure. I perform buttock augmentation with prosthesis. Buttock augmentation with prosthesis can also be done in two ways. The first one is the one incision method and the second is the two incision method. So, in one incision method, the surgery is performed right in the middle of the buttocks. In other words, through the coccyx, you go through a single incision, the stitches remain in between. If the patient wears a tongue, it's not visible between the two halves of the buttocks, a very faint scar remains. However, the surgery, which is performed with two incisions, leaves stitches marks on the right and the left inner sides of the buttocks. This operation is less problematic in terms of scars. It heals more easily and does not cause the stitches the line to tear. However, scars remain in the visible area. The sure marks will stick out like a sore thumb if the patient is wearing a tongue or something similar. The only problem with our one incision method is that the suture line can tear. But when can that happen? It could happen at the end of the second week. It could happen after three weeks. With this surgery, I don't think you should be afraid of the stitches line opening up because normally there is an opening, but it is a shallow opening. The opening occurs at the shoe line. It is only right up to the prosthesis and does not extend to the muscle. Since we are suturing with multiple stitches, the one under the skin does not open, but the shoe under the skin, it does. In this surgery, I consider small openings in the sutures to be normal. As a result, I wait for them. The problem occurs when the wound is so large that it cannot be closed. If it's too open to close by itself, then it must be stitched up. I believe this has only occurred in one patient to date. We had to stitch it up, but usually it heals with a bandage. If you don't do anything, the stitches will close there in a week or 10 days with dressing. That's why you shouldn't be afraid of one-line surgery. I recently attended a meeting, a scientific meeting. One of our teachers gave a lecture. He said exactly this. I used to do it from coccyx. There's an opening in the stitches lines. I was very afraid of having to remove the prosthesis, he said.
I've had a problem like that once or twice, and now I do it with two incisions, he said. He cuts the right and left side of the buttocks next to the cock sex and inserts the right prosthesis into the right side and the left prosthesis into the left side. Well, I think it is better to do from cock sex to do it with one incision method. The scar remains less. It remains in the invisible place. And with these surgeries, you have to accept small opening in the stitches. You have to accept it as normal. That can happen. There's another difference between the two cases. For example, in the two incision surgery, in the right and the left buttock surgery, you can send the patient home faster. It can heal faster. I think the patient can sit after a week or 10 days, for example. However, for surgery three cock sex, we can't sent the patient home sooner than 17-19 days. We absolutely let the patient stay for two weeks. The patient stays here in a residence near our clinic. He stays in a place with a kitchen like home. The patient makes her own food at home and so on. We go and make her first dressing in the place where she is staying. Now we don't want the patient to walk to the clinic for the first few days of suturing. We have her stay in hospital for a day or two. Because these implants, intramuscular implants, cause pain. We discharge the patient after one or two days of hospitalization. After that, we make the medical dressing by going to the place where she's staying. After the four dressing or so, at the end of the week, the patient slowly begins going outside from the house. She starts to come out of our clinic for checkup by herself. After a week or so, if we haven't seen any problems at the sutures line, we allow the patient to shower at the end of the week. We say, you can shower now. If no opening is seen in the sutures, we continue for the checkup for another week. We let them to get on the plane by the 17th or the 18th day. We had patients who insisted on leaving early. Unfortunately, I have a bad memory on this. One lady came from Germany. She wanted to go back very quickly and she went back. We didn't recommend that she go back that early. But after she went back, her stitches ruptured. To avoid showing that to her family, she put a napkin over it and had an infection. Is a napkin placed over an open once? The patient caught a microbe. What happened next? She got infected. In one of the hospitals there abroad, the prosthesis had to be removed. I did that on a relative of a friend from England. The patient was a male, by the way, a bodybuilder. He wanted a butt prosthesis. We did it. The man wanted to leave on the 15th day. I said, don't let him go. Let him stay for a few days more. It's, it was really important. The patient said to me, has bought his plane ticket, he will leave. I said, there's nothing to be done. I warned him. After the patient came back, he sent me a picture. There was nothing in the picture. The sure had not been opened. I said, good luck and get well soon. A week later, he sent me another photo. You saw, it's been three weeks now. Three weeks later, a week after the man left, there was a small opening in the suture, like my thumb. Well, I said a bondage should be made, and it was closed with a bandage. Such a, such a great chance. It's also interesting that the man went and didn't have any open suture. But after a week, when he went home, it appeared. You see, these things can happen. With this surgery, there might be a slight opening in the suture. That should be considered as normal. Well, being afraid of the suture opening up and switching to the two incision method, I don't think that it is right. It is a method which I don't prove that much. In this operation, a suture opening is normal. A skin opening the size of a finger, two to three centimeters, is a possibility. If it doesn't need stitches, it heals with a bandage. Even if the opening is too big, I think we took a patient for the surgery with sure that area back shut. We sent the patient with, without any problems. Other than that, I have said the prostatis should be made on a case treated with fillers. I myself was wrong about one of my patients.
The patient told me that she had a filler, but she said that four years after passed, after the surgery, now that the companies are introducing us to these fillers, here's what I remember. In two years, she loses it, the half of it. So in four years, I said most of it is gone and there's very little left. When we got into the muscle in the surgery, we saw that it was soaked up with filler on the inside. We cleaned the filler, wiped it throughout, washed it with a serum, washed it with a baticon, washed it with antibiotic serums. We wiped it well, dried it. We thought there was no more filler. We put the prosthetist on and closed it. After the patient left, after she returned to her hometown, I think two to three weeks later, an inflow started in the patient. So even if there's a small amount of filler, it leads to a fungal infection. In my patient, there was no infection, a discharge began. There was no growth in the cultures because it is a fungal infection. In a case of a fungal infection, a special culture has to be done. Since the bacteria don't multiply, you should understand the following. This is not a bacterial infection, this is a fungal infection. There's no much discharge that is necessary to remove the prosthesis. For example, in this patient, the prosthesis had to be removed. These points are important. There should be not a prosthesis placed in the patient with filler for at least 10 years. Small openings in the sutures can also occur with one excision method. The risk should be accepted. It should be accepted as normal. I saw a normal incision on both sides in a gay patient. I had gone to a French surgery for something else. They said the patient also had the buttock prosthesis. We said, let's look at the sutures line. And I saw there was a scarring on both sides. I mean, a very bad scar. Was there a scar on the buttock? I mean, it affects the patient's whole life. It also affects the sexual life, to put it plainly. That is, long sutures on both halves of the buttocks on both sides. It's not a pretty sight. I think this surgery should be done from the coccyx with a single incision from the midline, then it's not so noticeable. It leaves a scar like a surgery for ingrown hairs, right in the middle. It's not very noticeable. That being said, I had called a friend earlier. More specifically, he wanted to come and check out the surgery. I said, okay, let's go. So I said, we have a surgery, botic prosthesis, on that day, I called my friend. Well, he said during the surgery, oh my God, he said, you don't use light retractors? You perform it without seeing the inside? He was a little bit like he didn't like the surgery. In fact, in this surgery, I blindly opened the cavity of the prosthesis. I go inside the muscle, leaving a centimeter or two of the muscle above it. After that, I were completely blind. I set the dissector inside and opened the gap by palpating it from the outside with my hand. But I am always in the muscle. I leave a 2 cm thick muscle on top and open a gap underneath. What my friend doesn't like is this. There is no light acutuation. We don't see the inside as clearly. We don't give the light to inside. And we don't open the tissue by cutting. I think it makes much sense to be opening up then directly. Why? Because in blunt dissection, you rupture the blood vessels even if there's a small vessel there. When the veins rupture, their ends shrink and there are no bleeding. The bleeding stops automatically. When you use the light retractor and cut inside, the thin blood vessels are cut properly wherever you hit the blade. It is cut with enough and there is bleeding because the, the tip does not shrink. I think if, if the knife and light retractors are done, the chance of hematoma is much higher in this operation. In other words, the possibility of bleeding and blood pooling is higher. That's why I always do a cult dissection. And I do it blindly, with one hand out, one hand on the dissector. I open the gap and controlled manner. Another characteristic is that I don't open the gap too much. I always make the gap to a minimum. Then we go down to put the prosthetics in. It doesn't go in. We take it out and open it up a little bit more. We try when it doesn't go in. We take it out and open it a little more. We open it in a controlled way. After three or four times, when we try to put the prosthetes in, the prosthetes goes in. But you know what happens then? It swells like this because it fits the bottom. It doesn't look really nice. The prosthetes seem to be tight inside. 
when the prostate is, is in, I open its circumference a little bit more, the prostate relaxes more, but it's really hard. It's still being handled. I open the circumference a little bit more. The prostate just fits like that now. You touch the outside, you don't feel the prostate. It takes seven to eight times to reach the final state. Well, we try the same thing over and over without getting bored or tired. We increase the gap millimeter by millimeter. Prosthesis fits perfectly. If you rub your hand like this, the prosthesis won't get on your hand. There is no hardness. The prosthesis is completely in its place. At this point, we stop struggling to put the prosthesis in. The prosthesis is now right in its place. It just sits in the cavity. I think this surgery should be done this way. By doing like this, very slowly, because if you open the gap too wide, the prosthesis slides left or right. There's a deformity. The prosthesis should fit perfectly in this area. In order to make it fit properly, it must be first opened small and widened millimeter by millimeter until you reach the wider area where the full prosthesis fits well. This is how we proceed with the operation. And one more characteristic. This, by the way, is officially a professional secret, for what I am about to tell you is not in the books, nor is it in the articles. It is a knowledge that can only be gained through experience. It's always written in the books. When inserting the prosthesis, pay attention to the lower part. If you go too far down, there's a sciatic nerve, there's a possibility of injuring this sciatic nerve. Now, in practice, it's very difficult to be honest. The sciatica is so low and so deep in the muscle. Actually, going down there and injuring the sciatic nerve. So, the surgeon must be a moron. I'll tell you that straight out. Here the main problem is not down there. You cannot go, go down there far anyway. You have to work very hard to injure a sciatic nerve that is so special. The real problem is the one that can arise without you realizing it at the top. That's very interesting. It's not in any book. It's really a professional secret. I'll tell you this very clearly. There's a place at the top where this gluteal muscle attaches to the bone. It sticks right into the edges of the hip bone. The mass of the muscle is thick at the bottom and gets thinner towards the top. It gets thinner and thinner and sticks to the bone. If you get too close to the thinning area, the muscle there detaches from the bone and becomes weaker. The prosthesis starts to be felt there. I experienced this with one of my patients. Well, it was a case that made me very sad at the time, because the girl was very beautiful. A blonde chick, a very pretty lady. A skinny young patient like a Barbie doll, who got a breast prosthesis. We did a buttock prosthesis, it was perfect. The only problem was that because we made the muscle thinner on one side, the prosthesis began to be felt when touched there. That's where we thinned the muscle a little too much. We opened it up from the bottom. It lifted off the bone slightly. When we put the prosthesis, that upper border began going up and it was felt when touched. It's not a big problem, but it was a problem that interfered with perfection. There's nothing we can do about it and sent the patient away. Actually, there was nothing to see. So there's nothing to see, but you understand it when you touch it. The same patient came to us for another surgery maybe four or five years later. When she arrived, I examined her. I saw that the situation was improving. It was a very interesting thing. I mean, really, there shouldn't be a, such a problem. You have to be very careful when you open up when you open the upper parts. But when it does open, it gets better with time as far as I see. Because what's the reason for that? The prosthesis settles a little bit under the action of gravity. So it doesn't force the upper part. It doesn't force the part of the muscle where it tends. The prosthesis is settled down. It's slanting down. I think that the upper part of the muscle reattaches to the bone. Because there was no such problem with patients anymore. Nevertheless, this is a very important point. As I said, we open the gap millimeter by millimeter when we prepare the upper part. I think there are two places to pay special attention. The first one is the upper edge. You shouldn't make it thinner. The second one is the outer part. The outer side of the buttocks. It opens up very easily. 
The prostheses can slide out immediately. Therefore, it is necessary to open the gap very carefully. And one more thing I can say about this operation. At the end of the operation, we make the dressing with a very strong plaster. It's very strong. There are glues, there are special tapes, there are bandages. We do it with these. The plaster that are used in every surgery don't work. That being said, an interesting application I've done. After the patient comes out of the operation, we put a post-it on her buttocks. No injection from here. Because the nurse that we handed the patient during the day knows, we told her, this is a gluteal prosthesis case, so no hip injection should be done. If a painkiller is to be given, then it has to be done from the leg or the arm or it's added to a serum. But it's human that information not be given to a nurse who comes in at night. They definitely reach further. Just in case, I stick a post-it on the patient's buttock so that no injection is made from there. Important thing for the safety. By the way, these patients can go a lifetime without injection from the hip. I have to make a note of that. This is not a loss. If an injection has to be done from the hip, it can be done either in the leg or in the arm. There is no difference. It is the same. The important thing is that it is made back into a muscle mass. If you can't do it in the hip, you can do it in the leg. It's the same thing. That being said, what I can say about the bottom implant is that we've done it in male patients in the last few years. It's an interesting that I can tell you it is a very nice thing. This prosthesis is done on male patients who do bodybuilding. The man has developed all of his muscles, the pecs are great, the abs are great, the arms and so on. But he has no gluteal muscle in the buttock. It is completely flat. So, now the patient is standing there, like this, showing his arms, showing his pectoralis or something, but there are no hips. It's like a corner of a painting is missing. There's the piece of a puzzle is missing. It is officially incomplete. Putting a medium-sized prosthesis in the buttocks of these patients has the effect of putting the missing piece of the puzzle in place. That would be really nice. In the first male patient opera I operated on, they took the man to his room on a stretcher and then we went out together. He was lying face down, of course. We saw the man naked because they pulled the covers up while they were moving him from the stretcher to his bed. I said, the man has turned into a Greek statue. I'm serious, officially. I mean, the whole body is looking very good. And when the hips also came up, the results was great. Very, very successful. If male bodybuilders have a flat hip area, this surgery gives a very good result. Also for slim women. If the patient is slim and they have a teen waist, has no cellulite on her legs, and her hips are flat, in other words, if the breasts are large, if they have prosthesis, if you put in a buttock prosthesis, that patient turns into a Barbie doll. Those are my favorite patients, really. As a result of your work, you make a banging case. Professional satisfaction at its highest level. You know what I mean? You get a very good result. Male bodybuilders and slender women. Those are the nicest patients for this surgery. That being said, prosthesis vary from year to year. For a while, companies mainly emitted prosthesis with roughness, with a rough top. Then, for a time, they produced flat prosthesis. So, it changes from year to a year depending on what articles published like that. I think prosthetics in particular are still in demand right now. The companies have been putting them out. I haven't noticed much difference between the two of them. I usually use the straight ones in the buttock area. We have also had two interesting events related to these surgeries. One of the patients came to us for a follow-up. He said, so-and-so, I have a problem. The prosthesis is felt when you touch it. How can it be felt by hand? How so? I placed it inside the muscle. Where can I put it so it's deeper in? We examined the patient. The woman was so thin. The woman was so thin. Her body literally melted down. She broke up with her lover, couldn't eat, vomited what she ate, and so on. I mean, 
She dropped down to like 42 kilos or something like that. It was unbelievable. All that was left of the patient was skin and bones. I checked her buttocks. There's no muscle left. All melted away. I told this lady, if you lose that much weight, of course you'll feel like prosthetis by hand. What covers the prosthetis is the muscles inside the buttocks. And that muscle has melted away. So there's nothing we can do as a surgeon. I told her, you should go and speak to a therapist or a dietitian. You need to regain and fix your eating habits. You need to gain some weight. This is not something we can do. I sent the patient away. After a while, a month later, I guess maybe two months later, they asked for my defense statement from the local health authority. That was a legal paper. She made an official complaint about me. I told her to go and see a shrink and the patient makes a complaint about me. This patient also made that complaint online. No one even saw the patient in person. In my statement, I wrote this. Call the patient and meet with her. No one has even seen the patient in person. Maybe the patient has a life-threatening condition. She lost so much weight that her buttocks muscles even melted away. And she's also one of my most beautiful patients. Before, I mean, she was already a teen and the hip prosthetis looks so good on her. When they get such a disease, it is so bad. They get thinner and thinner. The patient becomes all skin and bone. I said that the, this patient needs to be called in and directly to a psychiatrist. I explained the whole incident. Her whole body has melted away. And since the muscles on her hips are gone also, you can feel the prosthesis when you touch it. This is not a problem caused by me. So, some time has passed, another similar case came in. This time, my patient was a model. And she fought with her boyfriend. And she didn't eat anything, and when she did, she threw it all up and all. She lost some weight, and you can feel the prosthesis there. But she says, Doctor, I have made a research, this is a model disease. So, you learned about it. Good. If you lose excessive amounts of weight, then you can feel this prosthesis when you touch it. How could you not? We place them inside the muscles. Since we put them inside the muscles, it is covered by the muscle tissue. If you are down to 42 kilograms and turn into skin and bones, that prosthesis will be felt right there. So it doesn't have anything to do with the surgery or prosthesis or surgical technique. You know what I mean? These are the most serious problems I have ever experienced in these surgeries. These patients come directly sometimes to blame the doctor regardless of their weight. You need to be in an ideal weight. The muscles should not have melted or anything. Okay, you could be thin, but I'm not talking about being so thin like you are on your deathbed. Apart from that, apart from that, I think it's a very bloodless, safe, problem-free surgery. And it doesn't take as long as it is predicted. Our last surgeries end in an hour. I'm talking about two butts, right and left. It takes an hour, including the two. Because we have a video of these surgeries. I have been videotaping every surgery about nine years. I'm going in with GoPro in my old GoPro camera. The batteries would run out exactly in one hour, just one hour. I was using GoPro 3 since I have used it for many years, the device is dead now. Last time it was broke down, not working anymore, so I changed it. The batteries are dead, we got a new GoPro. It shoots for about an hour and 20 minutes. The taping of the surgery ends in less than an hour. The surgery is over. When we get out of the surgery, I take the GoPro off of my forehead and turn it over and see how many minutes has passed. Shall I give you another trade secret? There are two reasons for me to take the camera off and look. First, to see how many minutes have passed. It appears right there on the screen. It reads 35, 45 minutes. I see the minutes, how many min minutes it has been. Also at the end, it also captures me like that. Because at once, I showed the surgery record to a patient. The patient watched it. And in the end, he said to me, where are you, doctor? I didn't see you. He said, maybe you didn't perform the surgery. How would I know? Patients are also very skeptical. 
after that day, we do this. At the end of the surgery, I take the camera off and I look at the camera. How many minutes did I take? I see the minutes and the camera records me. So I'm recording that the camera is coming off from my forehead. What should I do? Patients are so skeptical. Anyway, this has become our routine as well. As I said, it's an extremely safe, bleeding-free surgery that takes about an hour. It is a little bit painful after the operation. The patient has to take this into consideration now. For a while, for two days, the patient is hospitalized and we give strong painkillers. And after that, for a week or 10 days, it will be a bit troublesome. She will lie face down at home. We will let her sit later at the end of a week. We go and do her first medical dressing. We are trying to facilitate that period as much as possible for the patient. If you take these into consideration, it will give you a very good result if you are a suitable patient. Let me also make you a final note of this. We don't perform this surgery for everyone. Who I operate on, this is written on my website. If you take a look at aestheticpopo.com, we have some criteria on this on the first page saying such and such patients are accepted. Also, we don't accept some patients at all. Revision cases. Either the patient has become operated elsewhere, a revision has been made and she cannot recover. The patient comes to us, well, I swear I don't take these cases because listen, there are two problems in these patients. Either the patient is not a correct case from the very beginning. She's a wrong chosen patient. Whatever you do, even if I perform the surgery at first, even the first person who did it would not be able to get a good result from this patient. There is no point in accepting that patient for a revision. If she's not a suitable case, it should be done, it shouldn't be done at all. We don't accept patients for revision surgery. Secondly, these patients sometimes end up badly. After that revision is made, etc. Meanwhile, some ligaments in the true lines in the buttocks are injured and get damaged. It distorts the entirety. After that, you cannot perform a proper surgery on those disintegrated st structures. You cannot make a revision. For instance, there is a ligament on the coccyx. That ligament must be so strong that we can make a stitch there. If that ligament is gone, it is very important now that the stitch will not be the way you want. That's why we don't accept the re revision patients. In other words, we don't accept the cases where they were operated elsewhere, had problems and they did not get good results. Let me say this as a final note. If you want to know about the surgery in general, check out my website aestheticpopo.com. There are a lot of drawings there. There's a marking how the surgery is marked, how it is planned, what kind of prosthetes are there. There's an information about them all. In this video, I wanted to talk about the things that I didn't talk much about there. As I said, curious patients should take a look at aestheticpopo.com website. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video.